Okay, last day, first talk we have our main affair, and he will speak about <laughs> a very long title. No, but it's vertex transitive uh, graph. Yes. Uh, the composition and application to random work, something like that. Not exactly, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's the most I could remember. No, anyway, I'm talking about um, a quantitative analog of uh, Varopoulos theorem <coughs> for uh, finite sequences of uh, finite vertex sensitive graphs. So uh, let me remind you uh, this famous result of Varopoulos. So you take gamma, a finitely generated group. And let's say mu um, symmetric finitely supported probability uh, that generates the group, so non the non degenerates. Then is the random walk with respect to this uh, measure is recurrent if and only if gamma has a finite index subgroup isomorphic to a subgroup of Z square. So in other words, it, if, it's also if and only if, if you want, if and only if the growth is at most quadratic. Okay. So my goal is to exp <coughs> would be to explain a finitary version of this. What do I mean by finitary version? I mean something that would make sense for a sequence of finite vertex sensitive graphs. Okay. So how can we um, characterize the fact that the, the Kelly graph is recurrent? One way to characterize it is by saying that recurrence for a vertex transitive graph is equivalent to the fact that the resistance from, let's say, the origin to a given point to infinity uh, is bounded. Oh uh, no, the, the other way around, sorry. Uh, is infinite, so let's say transients. So one way to, one way to, to give a meaning that uh, for, for a random work to be, to be transient for a sequence of finite graphs, for instance, is to say that for the sequence, uh, the resistance is uniformly bounded, okay? So that, that would be just a definition, a convenient definition for me. So definition, um, gamma n sequence of finite vertex transitive graphs. I'm only going to talk about the, random, the, the standard random work to simplify in my talk, okay? So a certain sort of vertex transitive graphs is uh, called <coughs> transient if um, for if there exists a constant C such that for all n, for all U and V in the vertex set of, of gamma n, you have the resistance electric resistance between u and v that is less than a constant, okay? So now there was a conjecture, which now is a theorem, a large part of, my, of, of, this, uh, of, of this work, the work I'm describing, 
will be a joint work with uh, Matthew Twinton. And another part will be a joint work with Matthew Twinton, Benjamini, and, uh, and uh, Jonathan. Hernan. Um, okay, so uh, the first theorem I'd like to, to write is uh, quantitative version, so a character, uh, not a characterization, but almost, let's say, of this, which is a conjecture of, uh, this is also, this was a conjecture of Benjamini and Cosma. Ah, Benjamin is here, so. And Cosma is here, too. <laughs> Perfect. It's the right time, somehow, to quote that. OK, so the theorem is that um, if the size of gamma n is more, is uh, up to constant, this will always be up to constant, is more than the diameter of gamma n times log the diameter, then is transient. Okay? So let me give you an example. Of course, if you take the sequence With the usual, st with the standard generating set, this is recurrent. Okay. And uh, the, if I'm not wrong, the resistance grows like log n. Now, if you take a perturbation like that, and if let's say m depends on n. And if mn is little o of log n, uh, there is a square here that is missing. Ah. Sorry, this is my uh, sorry. I forgot the square. Excuse me. And here, of course, there is a square, so which I'm also forgetting. Sorry about that. So if I'm just perturbating this to make the volume a bit bigger, but if I take a little o of n, then it remains recurrent. But if I take mn to be at least log n, then by the theorem, it becomes transient. And in this sense, it is optimal, although it is not an if and only if. OK, so yeah. Just to understand your annotation, this means if there exists a constant or large enough constant, what is exactly the meaning of this? Of being transient? OK, so we can reformulate this in terms of heating times, as you, as you know. I just want to make sure, right? Yeah. You stated this as a statement about sequence of graphs, but yes. you can actually give you can make it like if you look at the ratio between the two sides, then you can have, you can bound the... Absolutely. So if you want, there is a, another way of stating it, which is equivalent, if you prefer this way, which is that... Um, equivalent statements Uh, 
gamma. For all u and v in gamma, the resistance is less or equal than, and I hope I'm going to do it right, uh, the diameter of gamma square divided by log Uh, divided by gamma times log of the diameter of gamma. I hope that this is uh, it's supposed to be bounded when uh, this is so. Th this is okay. Okay. What? Plus one. You're right. <coughs> um, yeah. So now, in terms of heating, he in heating of heating times, so remark uh, this has an equivalent. formulation in terms of maximal expected heating times the maximal expected heating times is um, the same as the resistance the effective the maximal resistance between two pair of points, so up to constant, multiplied by uh, the volume of gamma n. So this, uh, here let's take the degree to be bounded, okay? Not to worry about this. And then if you take a sequence of bounded degree graphs, then what it says is that um, the um, expected heating, the, let's say the heating time is proportional to the, to the volume as long as um, the, the volume satisfies this bound. Okay. So if it's large enough. So it has to be a bit larger than just quadratic. It has to, there is this log correction for, for it to be true. <coughs> okay. So um, before explaining um, the ideas behind this proof, this I'm going to talk, call it theorem A. I'm, doing, I'm going to explain another theorem, which is now related to the mixing time. So I don't know which one I should erase here. Maybe this one. So here we have a theorem with Itai and, uh, and Jonathan. We said the following thing. So before stating the theorem, which I'm going to call the theorem B, let me just give you an example. Um, if you take Z mod uh, NZ to the D with the standard generating set, so the standard random walk on this guy, or given D. And here, D is fixed, and N is supposed to go to infinity. Huh? That's the spirit. Then what is the, um, what is the mixing time of this guy? The mixing time of this guy, the L infinity mixing time, is uh, of the order of uh, N square. Uh, N square can be rewritten as the size of gamma N to the um, uh, 2 over d, OK? Conversely, we 
we have the following theorem, which is a weak converse, of course. Uh, this is not a strong converse, but which tells you the following thing. It tells you roughly that if you have such a behavior for the mixing time, <coughs> then the graph has to look like, in a gromov hausdorff sense, it has to look like this, this graph. So to be more precise, here is the statement. Um, And suppose gamma n is a sequence of bounded degree vertex transitive graphs such that the mixing time of gamma n is, um, is C times gamma n do d over d. Then uh, gamma n, if you look at gamma n and you rescale by its diameter, it doesn't necessarily converge, but it has a subsequence that converges to uh, torus. of dimension <coughs> at most d. So if d is not an integer, then you have to take, of course, the integer value. OK? So um, what it says is that if you want to forget about the sequence and so on, which I prefer personally, but I, I thought it would be easier somehow to, to, to write it this way. But you can make it quantitative statement for a given graph, finite graph, then what it says is that, and can be actually a bit more precise, what it actually says is that gamma n d is one, a certain error, posi uh, additive error term, which is smaller compared to the, small, small compared to the diameter. Actually, it has to be one minus epsilon for a given epsilon. Um, quasi asymmetric. to such, uh, well, I should say, uh, yes, to, uh, sorry, to a torus of size comparable to, to diameter. Of course, everything has to be uh, quantified correctly. So what, what it is is that epsilon, epsilon only depends on C and D, okay? And the comparable, everything, all the constants which are involved there have only to depend on C and D. These are the only thing which, which enter, and the degree also, the degree. Excuse me? Yeah, now you have to think that this is only a random sequence. It's a complete, not random, the word is not well chosen, but it's, a, it's a any sequence. So you can take a sequence that converges to a certain tor torus, you can take another one that converges to another torus, and then you can just uh, take one and you see it. So there is no, it, it, what it says is that this is a locally compact in the sense of gromov hausdorff and that whenever you take a cluster point, which is, a sub which is just a limit of a, of a subsequence, then it has to be a torus. And the dimension is bounded above. Uh, now there is um, finally a, a last statement, which I'm going to state before explaining a little bit how you prove these things, which now has to do with both the mixing time and the, uh, maybe this one I won't erase it because this one I'm going to talk about later, so how can I do it? So, uh, last statement, theorem C. Um, before stating the theorem, again, I will give you, I will give you an example. But so, this is now, again, with the same author. So, it's Benjamini. And now, it's about mixing time versus uh, um, heating time. So, before, let me give you an example. So, if you take just gamma n, 
to be z mod n, z. Just a circle, if you want. Then what do we have? Then we have that t mix is roughly the same as h. So the heating time and the mixing time are the same, and they are roughly n to the square. When I say roughly, the constant only depends on, on nothing. <laughs> it's just a uniform constant, so you have no dimension. Okay? And the point of this theorem is that this is essentially an if and only if, not exactly again, and this is probably not sharp, but what it says, what it will say is that if you are in this situation, then again, you have subconvergence to this time a circle. Okay. So conversely, what you have is that if gamma n satisfies that, so uh, there is always an inequality in one direction, so uh, the thing time is always bigger. So if h uh, of gamma n is less or equal than a constant times t mix of gamma n, if there exists a constant c, such that you have this, then gamma n has a scaling limit, which is, some, which is the circle, up to a subsequence again, because you could sometimes converge to a cir circle of size uh, 1, sometimes a circle of size 2. Also. But the point is that it's a circle, so at least as a metric space, it doesn't have so many, uh, you don't have so many options. For a torus, you have many options. It's an uh, invariant Finsler metric, but it could change you know, depending on the generating set. Here it's. It's transitive, huh? Uh, oh, yes, I forgot to say. I mean, all, in all my talk, all the graphs will be transitive. Sorry. All the graphs are vertex transitive. Okay. Same thing. You, yeah. I mean, this is, this is just a reformulation. Uh, it's equivalent, actually. That's exactly the same. If you, if you take the definition of what gromov osdorf convergence means, it's the same as saying that. But you, you can be, of course, much more precise. You can give a real structure of the group, of the Kele graph, which is behind it, and so on. But I don't want to enter these details right now. It's not the point, really. OK, so now let me explain a little bit uh, what's behind these, all these theorems. Behind all these theorems is a structure theorem for graphs with uh, polynomial volume growth. Because in any of these, for any of these statements, you can always um, uh, reduce to the case where uh, the volume growth is not too large uh, in that most polynomial, for instance. Let's say for the first theorem, it's enough to consider the case when the, the growth is at least, um, is at most, uh, is at most uh, let's say, cubical, for instance. So what you need is um, you need a statement. You need a, a general statement that tells you what the vertex relative looks like under a certain condition on its volume, not being too big compared to its diameter, <coughs> certain power of its diameter. Okay. So, but before before explaining even this, which is essentially the core of of, of these arguments, or not 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 the core of these arguments, but a large part of the argument. Let me explain a little bit how you go from theorem A, how you deduce theorem A from such a structural result for polynomial growth uh, graphs. So I'm not going to explain in detail the proof of theorem A, but I will explain how you, wh what are the main steps somehow for the proof of the theorem A. Theorem A. So uh, an important ingredient, a crucial ingredient, is uh, a theorem, very, very nice, elementary, but very nice theorem. I should say nice because also it is elementary, of uh, Benjamini and Cosma. Which is also nice because it, it works for any graph, any finite graph. It doesn't have to do with vertex transitive graphs. So it doesn't use the structure or anything, not even the symmetry of the graph. So the statement is the following. There exists a, uniform consta a universal constant C, 
such that for any finite uh, graph, connected graph, for any u v in the, in the graph, we had that the resistance between u and v is controlled by a quantity, which is a little bit ugly, let's say. But what is important about it is that um, this quantity uh, carries some, uh, is essentially of isoperimetric nature. Okay? So it's less than C times LU plus LV, quantity associated to, uh, to U and quantity associated to V, where LU is by definition, so this is the little bit ugly formula, n to the size of log gamma where you consider the size of the, of the vertex set. And you sum over, so all the sets you jump from two to the next, so you look at the max for all set subsets of size contained in gamma divided by 2 to the n and gamma divided by 2 to the n plus 1. A is connected and it, it contains uh, V, it contains U. So you, you have your vertex U and you look at A of size which are jumping like that. And you look at the max for all the size which are contained in, this, in, two, in, in these two uh, dyadic uh, decomposition of the volume. Maximum of what? Maximum of, you have two terms. The proof is uh, very nice, it's very understandable. Uh, I'm not sure I really have a very, very good intuition uh, of this. I mean, of course, roughly speaking, we understand that somehow the more the isoperimetry, uh, I mean, the more the, the, the boundary of the set containing U are, uh, is large, uh, the, 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 smaller, the smaller the resistance. Of so it's kind of... Okay, so... Now, what is the, how can you use this? Well, using that, we can um, prove another conjecture of Benjamini and Cosma. Again, myself with, with Swinton, which is again a conjecture in the same paper, actually. The, the, all the conjectures I'm talking about are from this paper. where they prove this statement. So the theorem is, again, a theorem for vertex transitive groups this time. Vertex transitive graph, finite vertex transitive graph. And suppose that, <coughs> uh, sorry, let, let me put the quantifiers in the right order. So for every D, and C, positive, um, there exists N0 such that for all gamma finite vertex positive graph such that the diameter whose diameter is at least N0, you have to take a large enough vertex positive graph you could also write it in terms of sequences, but um, if the size of gamma is controlled by C times um, the diameter of gamma at the power D, so that's again this uh, upper bound in terms of this volume growth, if you want, condition, but at only one scale, the scale of the diameter, uh, then we have the following isoperimetric inequality. Ah, I forget to say that there exists a constant, sorry. So, yeah, N0 depends, let me be very precise. 
And there exists, for every graph, sorry, and there exists also a constant C, uh, which is positive, and depends on, this one depends only on D. But uh, well, don't worry, I mean, this, uh, just look at it uh, in broad terms. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. This is a small c, but let me let me write it alpha. Let me call it alpha. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. So what does it mean? So th what is this this um, this uh, isoparametric inequality? Is the typical isoparametric inequality that you have in uh, ah yes, and for all a of size less or equal than gamma divided by two, of course. You have also a spectral gap inequality that you can prove in the same way, uh, which is just the L2 version of this, or the LP version of this would work as well. So this is just exactly the inequality that you would have in ZD. Well, of course, if D is an integer, it's an integer. Here it gives you something a little bit better when D is not an integer. Okay. So this is we exactly have this. This hold holds in uh, Z mod N Z to the D, if D is an integer. But I'm not saying that D has to be an integer for this uh, statement. Okay? So what does it say? It says that, well, oh, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I made a mistake which is a big, a big one. <laughs> it's the other way around. <laughs> it's the other way around, sorry. Uh, let, let, me, let me go back. It's bigger. The statement is for, I'm, I'm so used to, uh, to have a statement for, for the other, other inequality that, uh, I got confused, but what's important here is that you want the volume to be large enough, not small enough. Sorry about that. Okay. So if you have this inequality, so if the volume is large enough at scale d, then you have this isoparametric inequality. Now you would say, well, I mean, this is well known. Essentially, you just have to use Coulomb's set of cost inequality. The Coulomb's set of cost inequality tells you that if you are in a vertex sensitive graph, and if you have that the volume growth for every scale is um, at most r to the d, then you have this isoparametric inequality. So what's the difference? The difference between these two statements is that this one only holds for a given scale. You don't know anything about the volume growth at smaller scales. You don't know what the, scale, what the size of the ball of reduced uh, diameter, log of diameter, for instance. A priori, you don't know. So of course, the key, uh, the key argument to prove this statement is something that will tell you that in complete generality, if you have a vertex relative graph, and if at sc some scale, you see that the ball is at least a polynomial of degree d, then it had to be the case all the way from scale 0 to the scale at which you witness this lower bound on the, on the volume growth. In other words, at least in the went of polynomial growth, the growth can only decay, can only decrease. It can never increase. Okay? So that's the, that's the final statement which is somehow at the heart of the proof uh, of, of, theorem a, of theorem A. And this is really, a, this is again a conjecture of this time only Benjamini. <laughs> Benjamini is everywhere. Um, so, yeah, so what I didn't tell you is that if you plug this inside this theorem, then you get theorem A. Of course, you have to work a little bit. I'm not saying this is completely straightforward. But the proof is relatively short and elementary. So once you have this, you can relatively easily get theorem A from the theorem of Benjamini and Cosma. Now, um, I want to keep theorem A here. Yeah, what I would, maybe I can erase this one. So let me maybe repeat what I've just said to make it really clear. So no, for the proof of theorem A, we can combine the theorem of Benjamin Cosma with this theorem here, which I, which is uh, here, which I'm going to call theorem A uh, A two. 
with theorem A2. Now, what about the proof of theorem A2? Well, theorem A2 will follow from the combination of Coulomb's set of cost. Which I explain orally with the following statement. Uh, this is not yet a structural result. Uh, I think I have enough. Mm, uh, Yes, I'm, I have enough room here to write, to write it down. So this is theorem A3, if you want. It's again uh, with, with Twinton, and it's a conjecture of Benjamini. This is the conjecture of Benjamini that started the whole thing, actually. So what's the statement? It's not a statement. It's no longer a statement about finite transitive graphs. It's a statement about any graph. Okay? So for all C and D, there exists N0, which is the minimal scale at which you have to witness the growth condition, such that um, yeah, there exists this, and there exists what, what else? I need to be yeah, there exists an, another constant, so there exists a k, which only depends on d, and that should be enough, which is uh, I think positive. Well, we'll see. Uh, yes, well, just finite constant, <coughs> such that. Um, for all gamma uh, vertex sensitive graph of finite degree, so locally finite vertex sensitive graph, but not necessarily finite, and nothing depends on the degree, this is important here. If for some n larger than n0, we have that uh, gamma is less or equal than C times um, N. No, not gamma, excuse me. The volume, uh, the ball of radius N in gamma is less or equal than C times N to the D. So if you see, no, no this time it's, it's smaller. <laughs> you will see why. You will see why. I will explain later. But this time it is the right direction. Then, then for all m larger than n, this has to. You have to think that in the previous theorem, this is going to be a smaller n. It's going to be the small balls, not the diameter ones. Okay. So what it says is that now, if you look at larger scales, the growth can only be smaller. In other words, the size of the ball of radius m. This is a will be less or equal than k, my constant, times the size of the ball of, of volume uh, n, multiplied by m divided by n to the integer value of d. It's not even d. It's integer value of d, which is, if you think about it, it really means something, that it's not only that the growth cannot, it, the integer value mean that there is some structure somewhere which is responsible for the further growth. Okay? Because this, this integer is not, an, is not anything. It is completely related to the structure. It is, uh, it is the volume growth of some certain nilpotent group. So, so you, do, I mean, you do use Gromov's theorem. No, this is, uh, in, you're right that there it's some kind of version of Gromov theorem, which is quantitative. No, no, but I mean, inside here, you're, uh, well, given what you said, you're using the version for that's a good question um, there is a compactness argument somewhere because you are using uh, because you are using indeed the uh, Breuer green tau which is not effective so the constants are, are universal but they are not uh, or un universally depending on, on this but they are not effective what this does not depend on the degree no no. 
these two theorems I mentioned do not depend on the degree. But you, would be, you should be worried that when I, mentioned, when I wrote the theorem A2, I didn't really specify what I meant by the, by the boundary. For this statement to be true without dependency on the degree, you have to take the external boundary. External vertex boundary. As in, theorem, uh, as in the theorem of Benjamini and Cosma. It's also the external vertex boundary. Uh, the actual precise statement of the, of the other theorem is more complicated than that. <coughs> but it cannot be exactly the fractional. It has to be up to a certain scale. It's uh, the upper blah blah, and after the other, another scale, it's the lower thing. And this is really what you need to put to get the theorem in the end. But I, I didn't want to write a complicated statement. So I wrote a statement which is correct, but which is not the best one that you would, uh, that you would need in order to get the... Okay. So, <coughs> so why is it enough? Uh, well, because what does it say? I mean, it says exactly what we wanted to know. It, it says that if you know that uh, you have a certain... that It just says that the, the degree of growth can only decay. That's what we needed, and that's what it says. Yes. For because the application works for integers as well. The argument integer part doesn't help. So why do you mm, let me let me see. Reinforce is very powerful, but that's where compactness must enter. The way, well, the way we wrote the proof, uh, we, use, uh, we use the integer value. I don't remember Sorry, why. I didn't want to apologize for distracting you. To continue with your plan. But yeah. As far as I know, there's no way, for instance, to take a vertex transitive graph of with a polynomial growth upper bound and find a doubling scale without still using some kind of compactness. Right. At least in copy generality. If you know a, a little bit in what kind of class of graphs you are, then maybe you can use some explicit, uh, like you know the group is linear and something like that, you can, you can do something. But indeed, in complete generality, you need to use this compactness argument. Yeah, because what I didn't say, of course, that behind this, at the very, at the first stage of the proof, you need to know that you need to be able to work with, with some structure. So you need to use broyer Vintao, which does not tell you uh, enough by far, I must say, you still have to work a lot, but it tells you that you are that you have to, to work, that you have to fight with nilpotent groups. You still have to work hard, actually, but you know that you will never escape from this world. This is really a, the the work, the main work of body of work of, of, of Matthew and myself is really in in the context of nilpotent groups, and not only about the groups and their structure, but also about the structure of the sets. Of the of the balls and so on. So <coughs> um, yeah. So what I wanted to do. How much time do I? I have some time. So um, yeah. So what I would like to. I, I'd like to. I'd like to to write uh, a structure theorem, which is not going maybe to be okay. I don't want to write something too technical. So I'm going to write something which is still of metric nature, but I will. Somehow, give you to guess what could be a, a, a purely algebraic statement. So, <coughs> for the other statements, for the other statement, the other theorems, the other theorems um, were talking about scaling limits. Okay, they were talking about scaling limits. So, um, behind the scaling limit argument was the general. Uh, theorem, which is uh, due to the following author, so it's due to uh, Benjamini Finu, Finu Tessera, if I may say so, uh, and Twinton Tessera. So this, uh, th I will tell you uh, why I'm putting. Uh, so this is uh, two different statements somehow. Uh, so the statement is the following one. So but you're conditioning what? You're conditioning 
<laughs> ah no, actually, it's, it's, yeah, it is condition, yeah, but it should be the other way around. So, <laughs> no, this, this comes first, and this one is an improvement uh, of the theorem. So, assume gamma n. Um, Of, no, not bounded degree. It's a sequence of vertex transitive graphs, of finite vertex transitive graphs, uh, such that for some constant c and d uh, are given. Then, uh, yes, sorry, I forgot to write something. So it's a, even a relative statement, which is enough. The degree then uh, gamma n scaled by the by the diameter uh, subconverges. to a torus. So, of course, you have a, a finite array version of this, which is more interesting. So, this is a, this is an ingredient that we use uh, in a, in our theorem with the with the, the other theorem with the, the two theorems with the, uh, Itai and, and Jonathan. Um, so what is due to the first uh, part and to the second part is um, uh, with, with uh, Itai and, and, and Hilary, we just proved that it converged, it converged to a torus, but we couldn't get really an upper bound on the, on the dimension. We could, I mean, we knew that there was an, an upper bound, of course, <laughs> but we, we didn't know what it was really, and um, uh, we, we knew that if the degree was bounded, then we could get this upper bound when the degree is bounded. But when the degree is not bounded, it was really a much more complicated story. And it's only with math that we succeeded finally in proving that this was the same bound, same upper bound. So, so here there's nothing about the random walk? No, not anymore. So why is the log important? I mean, you had another function here, log to the 10, e to the, any subpolynomial function is still true? Which log? The, you have the assumption. It's degree, huh? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not writing correctly. <laughs> ah, sorry. No, no, this is my, uh, this is my fault. <laughs> Should be, no, no, there is no log. There is no log. But no, you, you make me feel bad because indeed there is no random work anymore. <laughs> that was actually the mistake. <laughs> um, okay, so. Yeah, so what I wanted to say is that, uh, yeah, um, yeah. So actually, there is a finitary version <laughs> of this theorem, which in spirit, I'm not going to write it down because it's a bit technical, but in spirit, what does it say? It says that if you have such a bound for a given constant here, you can forget about the n here, just a finite, finite graph, then what do you have? Then gamma n first is not far from being a kilograph, which was not clear from the beginning. It's just a vertex on graph. So it has a projection. Gamma n has a projection as a kilograph as a transitive graph, has a projection which is equivalent with respect to its automorphism group. It has a projection to a kilograph of not exactly of an abelian group, but of virtually abelian group, where the index is uniformly bounded. Okay? So that's the point. Okay? And the fibers, it's important also to understand the fibers, because it's a projection, so it has fibers. The fibers are uniformly small, like they are of size, they, are, they all have the same size. But they all have a size which is uh, a, a polynomial in the diameter of, of an exponent which is smaller than one. Y that you can nail down, it's explicit. Okay. So what it says really is that this is the if you want, this is the structure the structure result. So it, it says that gamma n has a 
has a, a projection to a kilograph of a virtually. Actually, virtually, uh, yeah, virtually abelian group with a bo uniformly bounded index. Of course, this doesn't tell you the whole story because it's not because you understand that uh, you are inside a virtually abelian group, even if it was uh, Z mod NZ. It wouldn't tell you much about what it looks like because it's very important to understand also the structure of the generating set. Let me give you an example. Maybe I can finish with a bunch of examples. If I take z mod n square z, let me, yeah. And I take, um, um, I take as a generating set, uh, 1 and n, plus or minus 1, plus or minus n. If I rescale by n, what does it converge to? <coughs> Excuse me? Converges to the torus. It has exactly the same limit, same limit as z mod nz times z mod nz with the standard generating set. Okay? So you can guess now that if I take a generating set which is very spread out, uh, there will be no, I mean, the dimension could explode also. So there could be no, no limit at all. It's not clear that there will be a limit, even if I am in a very simple abelian group. Let me give you another example. Why would it have to be a torus? That's something we may wonder. Why couldn't we approximate with a sequence of finite, uh, of finite vertex transitive graphs? Why couldn't we approximate a sphere, for instance? Well, there is a reason, which is more a moral reason, which is Jordan theorem. Maybe I should let you with that. Of course, there is a, a way from Jordan theorem to, to what we see. But essentially, what's, what's happening is that if you would be to approximate a sphere, it would mean that you would approximate SON with a sequence of finite group, which is not possible. Because with a sequence of finite group, you know that you are stuck at some point. Um, if you fix the dimension, of course, of SON, or you take SO, SOD, say, not SON, SOD, uh, then you know that at some point, the finite groups inside it will um, will be essentially virtually abelian with a virtual which is bounded above. Cannot, so at some point, it will become abelian if you take a larger and larger finite group in, in, uh, in SOD. And so, of course, this does not give you the answer because you could approximate from outside. But the point is that it's not possible to, ap to approximate from outside. If you start approximating a, a compact group, at some point, you live inside. That's another theorem, which is due to Kashdan. Um, no, it's due to Turing. The more, more ancient version is due to Turing. It's a very old theorem. Anyway, so uh, just a side discussion to say that the torus, there is no other option. But you may think of a very explicit example, which is Heisenberg over Z over, med, over, Z over NZ. And you may think, well, why doesn't it converge to something that looks like a nilpotent finite group? Uh, nilpotent whatever, I don't know why. Uh, actually, there is no candidate. But so what is Heisenberg mod uh, NZ? It's just a set of matrices. One, one, one. You take A, B, C, A, B, C in Z mod NZ. What's happening here? Why do we see a torus in the end? Why do we see a torus in the end? Suppose you take the standard generating set. You take uh, the matrix with one, zero, zero here and one, zero, zero here. Sure, usual. So this guy surjects. So just to z mod nz square. Now you have to think about the fiber. The fiber is the central subgroup generated by C, which is also a copy of z mod nz. But what's, the, wh what's about this fiber? This fiber looks like it has size n, but in terms of diameter, it is small. It has a diameter which is in a, the diameter of the fiber is in square root of n. Why is it so? Because you can go very efficiently in the C direction by just taking commutators. If you take uh, the commutator of then what you see is a, 
up to the sign, you see AB, meaning that you can go quadratically far away in this direction by using commutators of matrices of this, of this type. So th it's not efficient to use C to go far in this direction. So this thing is small. So the limit would be, again, the torus of dimension 2. Yeah, so you can, um, you have, I have many examples which are actually fun to look at. So maybe I'm going to give you just one since I don't have enough time. To Indeed, what you could do is you could take the same example. But suppose you rescale by square root of n. What do you see? What do you see? So what do you see in the, in, in the abelianization, the z mod nz? Well, the n tends, I mean, is big compared now to square root of n. So what you see is the Heisenberg. Here you have wheel. Here you have wheels. But what do you see here? Well, here you don't see everything because um, Here you see r mod z r mod z. Okay, so you see a, it's a vibration by a circle. Okay, this is what you see in the limit. Now, of course, if you take something which is in little o of square root of n, then you see the Heisenberg group. That's it. So you see that there is also a scaling limit theorem where you don't rescale scale uh, you don't rescale necessarily with respect to the diameter. And what you expect is to see a, 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 con a connected nilpotent degree. That's also a theorem that we have with Matt. And then the, so the dimension that you bound by D, but it's a homogeneous dimension. Maybe I'll stop here. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Universal uh, constant. Right. Universal constant and diameter squared. And we know that for the relaxation time, but the question is, do we speak for the mixture without any substance? Transitive transfer technology. Uh, like that, I need to think about it. <laughs> Uh, right now, we are trying to understand better the dependency on the degree, so that's somehow the good time maybe to... But even for boundaries, so take boundary degree, it's really degree C5. So the, so the trajectory that the mixing time will be bounded by constant diameter squared, so for all... Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, right. And th that, yeah, that's what you said in your talk, that we only know uh, n, n, n root and n to the cube. Yeah, we know, we know a diameter. Yeah, a diameter, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, more questions? Thank you.